Before I read today's scripture, I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to get in touch with whatever it is that is the real test in your life right now. My sense as a pastor is that it's pretty much universal. Everybody's got something that's testing them these days. Maybe for some of you it is health concerns. I'm just overwhelmed how every week we get news of yet somebody else with something serious health-wise, as we did this week. Maybe it's relationships, parents struggling over children, children struggling over parents. Maybe it's financial. If only you didn't have that credit card debt. If only you had not made such a decision. Maybe it's something about your workplace, the uncertainty of it, the stress of it. Whatever it may be for you, I invite you to get in touch with what is testing you the most these days. And then let, I hope today's message speak to that, if you will. So the word from James, as he gives his introduction to the church, then he says, beginning with verse 2 of the first chapter of James, he starts off with some very surprising words. He says, consider it joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. One of the great losses in the world of newspaper journalism was when the comic strip kudzu no longer was in existence. Anybody ever heard of the comic strip kudzu? Does that, oh, so it's good. Not around anymore, tremendous loss. And the reason us preachers especially loved kudzu was because one of the main characters in that comic strip was an off the wall preacher by the name of Reverend Will B. Dunn. Great name for a preacher. And so one day Kudzu is talking to Reverend Wilby Dunn, and he says, life is hard, preacher, to which the great Reverend Wilby Dunn responds, yes, life is like a test. You have to be prepared. And Kudzu says, that's great, but I prepared for a multiple choice test, and it turned out to be true and false. Don't we all sometimes feel that way? When it comes to the test of life that I hope you are already in touch with, that you are dealing with yourself these days. Some of us, if only the test came once a semester, that would be great. But for some in this room, it's every day. Or seems to just cascade and never go away, if only it would. And when the test of life comes, sometimes, yes, we pass amazingly with high grades. Other times... We know, to be very honest, we have just failed miserably. One of the great legends in the golf game was obviously Bobby Jones. He wrote a book once entitled, Golf is My Game. In it, he talked about how he laid out the famous Masters Golf Course in Augusta, Georgia. If you've ever been there, you know that along the 18th fairway, way off to the side, it's just a sand trap. It's there for no reason at all. It's not protecting any fairway. It's not protecting any green. And they ask you, why did you put that there? He said, there's a reason that it's there. It's a practice sand trap. And this is what he wrote in his book. He said, most golfers practice putting, practice hitting the woods, but the champions practice playing out of difficulty. Anyone can play the game of golf from tee to green. But the championships are won on the traps and out of the roughs, and life is that way. If you want to be a tea to green kind of person, you might take shortcuts to get there. But champions are made in the traps and in the roughs. I think the writer of James is trying to express much the same sentiment in these very few verses. And so I want to just real quick, only three verses what James is trying to say to us, how we deal and how we pass the test that is always going to come our way. And so he starts off with those, just sounds like preacher talk, consider it pure joy. Well, yeah, 
whenever you have trials. Notice he doesn't say, if you have trials. He says, when you have trials. Trials are not an option when it comes to the human story. And one of the worst messages any preacher can preach is that somehow you get Jesus in your life, then you won't have any troubles anymore. You know, just turn your scars into stars. Prosperity kind of thing, in which the Bible is completely dis- d- d- denied in what it says to us. Life is problem solving. Problem solving is life, period. And so the best attitude is not one that's always trying to stay one step ahead of our trials, but rather one that faces our trials, doesn't discount our trials, but then asks the question, what then can we learn and gain and grow through our trials? You know, for some, it may be a blister on their big toe, but others, it may be an aneurysm on their artery. For some, it may be they lost their wallet, but others lost their job. For some, it may be your plans for tomorrow got dashed. For others, it may be your dreams for all your tomorrows just got crushed. But whatever it is, the only guarantee is that there are going to be tough times if you live any length of time at all. James says three things, I think, about the trials of life. First of all, he says they come at inopportune times. Well, of course they do, and that's because when is there ever a good time to have something terrible show up (coughs) in your life? The King James Version here uses the word temptation, but the Greek really helps here. It's the word parosmos, from which we get the same word in English, the word pirate, which says in a sense that these troubles They can just terrorize us and they can attack us without any warning at all. And James goes on to say it's not just that they come in inopportune times, but they also come in all varieties. Again, the Greek here actually says they've come multicolored. I would say, and I think we all know this, that the trials, sometimes they just seem to be customized. They seem to just have our name on them. Which means that Something that may just unglue you might not bother me at all, and vice versa. And so I think we sometimes need to be sympathetic to this kind of thing. Realize that we should understand that for some, this is a real kind of thing, even though it may not be a real deal for us as well. And we see this multi-variety kind of thing, even in the life and ministry of Jesus He turns to the rich young ruler and says, you got to sell all that you have. But he didn't say that to the woman at the well. He didn't say that to Nicodemus. So to each of us, multicolored, customized, just seem to have your name on them sometimes. And you wonder why everybody else isn't as bothered as you are. Maybe you're having one of those weeks. Maybe you're having one of those lives, it seems like, sometimes. So what do you do with that? James says, first of all, to expect it. And maybe we can handle that because, yeah, we know that's, yeah, that does happen. But then the real shocker comes when he says, you are to consider it joy. I don't know about you, when troubles come my way or stress or test, Joy is not my usual first response. And I personally, quite frankly, have trouble with those Christians who go around and just act like, well, isn't it wonderful that I happen to be the favored person of God to be putting this test in my life so that I can grow in my faith? I never quite get that. I don't think that's an honest thing. When tests come, they hurt. When they come, they are painful. And we should not discount or some act Pollyanna kind of view, if you will. But what James here is saying, I think, is something much deeper. I think James is talking about what sometimes we call the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is that there's something deeper inside each of us, a foundation, a scaffold, if you will, that the world out there simply doesn't have the power to determine. 
It doesn't have a power over that. It doesn't have the power to define that. And there's some center that still holds when everything around is still uncertain. So how do we get there? That's the real question, isn't it? How do we get that kind of joy, that kind of strength, that kind of peace in our lives? James seems to suggest that right now is the time to start thinking about it. See that very first word he says, consider. Consider, if you will. We must consider now how we are going to deal with the troubles that inevitably are going to come. Before they come, we already need to know what is our plan of attack? What is our response going to be in faith? You know, we do this in every other area of life. If there's a storm coming, campers know to anchor their tent before the storm shows up. Back in the winter when they forecast the snow and ice, the supermarket shelves were empty because this is Wake Forest after all, and because they all knew that they had to consider ahead of time what might be the situation they found themselves in. And so today, James is saying now, consider how you will deal with the tests of life that are inevitably going to come. So how do we get to that point? Is it by sheer willpower? By just girding up our bootstraps, say, I will be joyful. I will be joyful. That's never going to get you very far because that's still relying on your own resources. But rather, I think when the tests come, to at least open up a window to see what God is kind of saying to you and doing with you through the test that were not given to you by God but what God can give you because we live in a world where tests are a part of it. If you go to the town of Clarksville, Tennessee today, you'll find a wonderful basketball coach named Howard Jackson. Howard Jackson in his college days was an all-star basketball player for Austin P State College, all conference several years. But then one summer he was working on the roof of a warehouse he accidentally stepped and fell through a skylight and dropped, 30, uh, dropped 80 feet to a concrete floor. Smashed many of his bones, some of them from his legs, smashed up into his spine. It was a terrible blow, but somehow he lived through it. But Howard Jackson loved basketball. And now he wasn't able to play basketball. And so he worked through it. Months and months, over a year, finally he was able to walk a little bit, then run, and finally get back to playing basketball, not in a competitive way, but a way that he could just be involved in it. But out of that, he decided that he wanted to coach young boys, to teach them the game that he loved so much. And so he wrote these words. He wrote, I won't say that I'm glad it happened to me. But I do understand some things I wouldn't have understood if it had not happened. I really love these kids, and I want them to love the game the way I did. If I hadn't had that fall, maybe I wouldn't be here now helping them. God has been good to me in spite of everything. If your soul is to grow, somewhere along the way it's going to require some growing pains. Here, I think, is the growing pain that when the tests of life come your way, there is every opportunity to rise or to fall, to grow up or to fall back. No pain, no gain is not just true for athletes. It's true for us in the Christian journey as well. James says that these tests, they will bring something in your life. They can give you gifts It says it will bring you endurance. It will bring you perseverance. It will bring you tenacity. It will bring you an unswerving faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Think about it. If, everything, if every day were nothing more than a walk in the park, none of us would know how to persevere. We learn by practice. We learn because these opportunities come our way. And so when we ask that inevitable question, why me, why me, why is this happening to me? Which, by the way, I think is an okay question to ask. It's an honest question. But don't stop there. Also ask, what in this test 
in this thing I'm going through in my life right now, what is it that is the game that God would have me know? What is it that I can learn from this and grow because of it? I just can't imagine God does this kind of thing without allowing that gift to be given as well. And so can the tough times of life be something we're thankful for? I don't, I don't know that I want to go quite that far. But I do want to say very honestly, when you don't really think about it, the growth times of my life, the times when I found out my faith really did make a difference, it didn't happen in the Galilees of my life when the lilies of the field were blossoming and the children were playing on Jesus' laps. It happened more in the Golgothas of my life. But some days it felt like as if even God had forsaken me. As a small boy once said, why are vitamins in spinach instead of ice cream where they ought to be? It's a good question. I I'm wondering the same. <clears throat> but vitamins are in spinach. And God truly is in every test that you are going through even right now in your life. And when we can make that wonderful transition, that wonderful growth from not just hoping that it's so and believing that it's so, but actually to that wonderful place where we experience that it's so, then there becomes a faith that I think can pass every test that comes our way. Charles Haddon Spurgeon understood this kind of thing. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was probably the greatest preacher England ever put forth. But almost his entire adult life, he dealt with one debilitating illness after another. During the most productive 10 years of his ministry, his wife was a total invalid. One night, he was in the bedroom with his wife, and a log was whistling in the fireplace. The gases were released from the wood, just for a moment produced a musical, beautiful tune. And Charles Hurt Haddon Spurgeon turned to his wife, Susanna, and said, it takes the fire to bring out the music. It takes the fire to bring out the music. And friends, what is true of logs is true of life. James says, face test head on. Face your test these days head on. And then he says, you will lack for nothing. There will be a wholeness. And isn't that really what salvation ultimately is all about? And isn't that what every one of us wants for our life today? And so may it be. So may it be. Our hymn of invitation this morning Hymn number 633, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. We had a wonderful large family come into our church family during the early service this morning. Maybe there are some this morning who also want to respond to invitation to give your life to Christ. Unite with this church for another church family or some renewed commitment. I'll be at the front to receive you. Let us now stand and sing to the glory of God, hymn number 633. Let me share a couple of quick announcements and before we welcome our newest family members. Let me first say a word of welcome to guests that are with us. We just celebrate so much that you add to our company and it's good to see friends from Virginia that are here and others that have graced our company. We have a reception and guest welcome center over to the side. Paula Goodson from our outreach team would love to meet with you. We'd love for you to stop by. We can get to know you and share any information. Let me remind you again that as you leave today, there is the opportunity to give a love offering that all of us in our unique ways can be a part of the team of support and love for Embrace Uganda. We wish so much for Dorothy and blessings on your journey of faith. And tell our brothers and sisters in Uganda that we love them. And hope to see Michael and Faith soon, <laughs> if you will give them that message. 
I hope again that you'll come out this afternoon at four o'clock for a reception and a celebration of Rob's ministry and appreciation for all the family who are sitting right here. Um, and last but not least, before we welcome, this is a vacation Bible school week. Uh, say a prayer for all of us. Uh, my favorite definition is called sacred pandemonium. Uh, so we look forward to that. One quick announcement about that. The online registration for that ends today. If you want to go ahead and register online, you got to finish that today. But you can still register Wednesday night. It'd be great if you come a little bit early so we can accommodate all that and get right into the flow of things. But we want to commission those who are ministering. You know, all the studies show that Vacation Bible School in just a few days is the equivalent of weeks and months that take place in Sunday school and other things. So this is a huge week, a real important week in the life of our church and the ministry to our children. So I want to ask at this time, everybody who is participating in leadership in any kind of way, teaching, music, crafts, food, sports, what have you, to stand at this time, if you will, if you're a part of that this coming week, everybody stand uh, who is participating in leadership in any kind of way. All right, and so remain standing. Uh, but hold your bulletin and everybody if you will turn we want to commission these we so much appreciate all of you who are giving of your time this week so i invite all of you if you'll join with me in looking in the bulletin the commissioning of our vacation bible school leaders believing that the privilege of teaching in vacation bible school is a divine opportunity to share the good news of jesus christ through word and deed Knowing that God is able to speak his message more clearly when his human instrument is prepared physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Remembering the admonition of the Apostle Paul to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. <coughs> Because we as Wake Forest Baptist Church recognize God's gift and purpose in your lives and in the ministry of Vacation Bible School. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. See. But now, if y'all would join me. <laughs> So it's a real celebration. This is a wonderful family, the Holland family. Lawrence, Kristen, Elizabeth, Kaylee, and Emmett. Yes, good. They all come upon transfer of membership uh, from Virginia, which is a great thing. Some of you know Lawrence is the son of Gene Holland, so he's got great blood. And we miss Gene, who passed away this past year. It was really one of our finest. But we are so glad the lineage lives on and this tradition and the belief of a loving family. And so we welcome all of you. We celebrate that you have added to our family by coming forward this day as a real celebration. We had a wonderful, the Joe and Tara Johnson family joined in the early service, so so many gifts that we are being given. So to let them know a tangible expression of our celebration, let them know about an uplifted hand, our sign of welcome and delight and I hope you'll come up and welcome our newest family members following the benediction. We're so glad to welcome you. So let us bow for the benediction and the response to follow. Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ within you. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, love all love. Jesus Christ our Lord, thanks be to God.